Welcome back to another GTN Coaches Corner where we answer all your questions about anything training related really. Remember to leave your hashtag GTN Coaches Corner comment on any of our videos, even this one, and uh, we'll get to answering it in a future episode. So straight into it, starting with this one from David Morgan Golf. Coming from a golf background, there are golf clubs that suit different levels of player generally. For example, a new golfer would benefit from a game improvement clubs over a professional that may use a bladed club that is more versatile. Is there such a thing with wetsuits? I'm an okay swimmer, a 101 for an Ironman swim PB, but I'm no quicker in a wetsuit. I'd consider myself an intermediate swimmer, so surely I shouldn't use the same wetsuit as a pro. I find when I seek advice, I get lots of generalized answers or people affiliated with certain brands who seem to push their products. So, is there an answer? Smiley face. Well, I don't know anything about golf and I don't know what a bladed club is. Do you know, Mark? <laughs> I was about to say exactly the same. I'm afraid we are not your people or your men to talk about golf or bladed clubs, but we do know a thing or two about swimming and wetsuits. And you're correct. There are different wetsuits tailored to different abilities. Uh, you could call the beginner, intermediate, pro, but actually it's not that. It's the type of swimmer you are. I mean, you have pro athletes using a not top end wetsuit if that makes sense so this is all down to how you swim in the water so if we were to categorize it you have a neutral swimmer someone who's quite flat in the water and that tends to be your better swimmers people may be coming from a swimming background and then what tends to happen is the hips and the feet sink and we have differing levels of that and essentially wetsuits that are tailored to those different but those positions. are not exclusive to pros. Sometimes good pros who swim really fast might actually have a slightly downward uh, position in the water. Uh, and it also, the pros don't necessarily want a better wetsuit that floats them more because they're really in a good position. If you have a wetsuit, you know, your question might be, why don't everyone just use the wetsuit with the most buoyancy possible? But if you're really swimming with your feet really near the surface of the water, a wetsuit with lots of buoyancy in the legs is going to almost put your feet out of the water and you're going to lose half your kick. It's also going to change your shoulder uh, body position for the pull and change the position of that pull, which you really don't want as a pro. So uh, it really depends on what type of swimmer you are rather than how fast you swim. Yeah, so the answer here is simply check out your swimming style. You can have it videoed, have someone to watch you and let you know how much your hips and feet are sinking, assuming they are, as you're saying, you're coming from a slightly intermediate beginner background and getting a wetsuit that suits that. As James has said, the wetsuits will have thicker neoprene around the hips and the legs to help increase that buoyancy and then bring those feet up to the surface. And that is gonna reduce your drag through the water and improve your 101 Ironman swim time. There we go. Uh, next question from Jamie Furman, who is a regular on GTN Coaches <laughs> Corner. He said, how do the pros train to handle so many races in a year? For example, Sam Long racing Ironman Chattanooga this coming weekend off 70.3 worlds, which didn't go too well for him. What a great um, example. Yeah, he did. Not to it. mention different distances. What can age groupers learn from their training regimes and how to plan race schedules accordingly? Obviously, no discredit to Sam Long because he has actually done He's superbly had an epic this week. season. Yeah. yeah, but he didn't do well at Chattanooga. Uh, but the pros have a major advantage in this in this field over your general age grouper and that is time which seems a little counterintuitive because what you've just suggested is that they don't have much time at all in between their races so how do they get ready for the next one well the thing is an age grouper training for a major event can justify leaving their family for five six hours on a Saturday to do that last big long ride and, and get really fit they can't really justify three days after the race, spending another five hours on their bike to flush all the waste products out of their legs and loosen up, whereas a pro can. And what you'll generally find is that's what pros are doing almost immediately after the race. In fact, after some 70.3s, literally being in the pool that afternoon, just swimming that crap out of your legs and out of your arms. Uh, and then the next day, very easy bike rides uh, for a couple of days. And you can spend two, three, four hours out there just really flushing all that stuff out, which an age grouper just can't. And then once you've got to that point, a pro could then take a day or two off and it could be a Thursday or a Friday or a Saturday or a Sunday. And whereas age groupers are very much around the working week, it's a, it's a lot more complicated to fit that kind of recovery and bouncing back into normal training in for an age grouper. So that's really the secret that pros have as far as uh, bouncing back from a race to get ready for the next race. There is also potentially an element of conditioning. Some pros may just be better conditioned to have 
they're even naturally or they've done the work, uh, maybe that's gym work or just training, etc., that they are just a little bit better conditioned to Well, that's another that. thing with the time. A, a pro can, can be putting in big miles for weeks, months before a race, whereas an age grouper really is going to only sacrifice that much time away from their family and their work uh, for the build-up for that specific race as opposed to all year round. So they are better conditioned to be at that higher level pretty much all the time until they have their little off-season break. Uh, it's not the same thing, you're not really comparing the same thing, so don't try and uh, mimic the race schedule of your top pros. It's uh, it's just not comparable. Unless, of course, you're living a life of leisure and you don't have a job. Yeah. Uh, next question, though, from Daniel Shen. said, hello, very cool presenters. <laughs> hey, I think he's talking about me here. Uh, um, maybe he's got us confused with the GTN presenters. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I've got another question in regards to triathlon training for someone still in high school. What would you recommend out of self-training, a coach and a triathlon club? I'm not too familiar how tri clubs work, but it seems like their club sessions all clash with my extracurriculars and schooling. Do they have any other benefits or should I just consider the other options? Well, the big benefits of a tri club is the social aspect. It's fun. There's lots of other guys on the same level as you or in the same challenges as you and you can learn from their mistakes and you can enjoy the whole scene. You can learn together, you can make mistakes together and you can learn from their mistakes. Uh, so it's really social, it's really fun. Uh, a triathlon is fun anyway, but it's even more fun with other people. That's the big benefit. Then of course, there's self-training. And the thing with self-training is you can do it on your own. Uh, it's enjoyable and it's challenging and if it's what motivates you and you self-motivated and you really enjoy just really smashing yourself and training really hard, it's very much an option. Don't don't be afraid of it. Uh, you can get really fit like that. Uh, but you have to realize that if you're learning the lessons yourself and you're then researching on things like this YouTube video, uh, it's going to take you longer than if you're getting some advice from a social, from a club, a tri club, or a coach. Uh, it's going to take you a bit longer, but maybe more rewarding because you've done it yourself and you've figured it out and you've uh, you've learned along the way. Yeah, um, and I would add to that that obviously you can just fit it in around your own time, your yeah, own schedule, exactly. your whenever own it suits you. Extra yeah. There is of course hiring a coach which can be invaluable. Obviously, again, you've got someone overseeing your program. They're bringing in a lot of expertise and knowledge into structuring that program to ultimately get the most out of you and really push you and really kind of build those sessions up and allow you to peak for a race if that coach is doing, doing a good job. Yeah, one of, the, one of the drawbacks with that though is you might actually end up training on your own more because once you've got a very specific schedule where everything fits in specifically for you uh, and the recovery is built in and everything, you're not so flexible as far as hopping on your bike and joining your mates for this ride or that run uh, because it's gonna mess up your whole week's training. So you might end up actually training on your own more with a coach but you'll probably see faster progress because it's your training for your weaknesses and your skills that you need to work on. So you basically got to weigh up all of those things. I guess it depends on your personality. If you really need the fun social aspect, then join a club. If you really need fast results and get to high performance as quickly as possible, hire a coach. And if you're just in it for the challenge and to see what you can do and see where you can get to and you love just achieving something, then go ahead and self-coach. Yeah, and I would add to that. I mean, you are able to join a club and there is no obligation for you to attend every session throughout the week. You may just join one session every other week, but there's a great thing, you know, being involved in a club, the community, the learnings you get and experiences from other people. And perhaps when you go to an event, there's other people from your club and you can travel with them. You've got that camaraderie and it just makes things feel a little bit nicer and easier. You feel a bit more at ease as you go to these events with them Absolutely. around you. None of these things are exclusive. You don't have to choose one or the other. You can mix and match. You can have a coach who builds into his program, your social club training sessions. Absolutely. Well, Final question from Ronan van der Vaart. Um, I'm 16 years and a very good average runner, sub 40 minute 10K, very good, and sub 90 minute 5K. But I want to start triathlon. What advice do you have for me? Well, swimming and biking. Yeah, obviously. No, but seriously, we don't have any information about uh, Ronan's swimming ability, but we're going to assume he's going to need some help. Uh, swimming is not like running. You can't just go out there and put the miles in and just thrash away uh, and get faster and better. It's very technical. You need someone to be looking at your stroke, building your stroke up from the beginning, making sure you're doing it properly. Otherwise, you might be wasting your time. Yeah, and I would say do that early on. A lot of people fall into the trap of plowing on, on their own, and just trying to figure it out, and then 
you've essentially enforced bad technique and it's yeah. very hard to then rewind and undo that. And what you'll find is you're a very fit but slow swimmer. Yeah, if you can get someone in there looking at your technique early on and really get that ironed out, good technique, and really ingrain that early on, and I feel like James is laughing because this may be how he, yeah. Um, yeah, do what I say, way. not what I do. <laughs> uh, you'll find it a lot, a lot easier. When it comes to cycling, just get out there, just ride. Absolutely, get a bike and go and ride. You'll be amazed at the freedom that a bike gives you when you actually start training on it. You can explore a lot further and a lot more fun than, uh, than you can on the run. I used to run everywhere in my training and then I got a bike and suddenly I was going 100 kilometers in one day and I was like, whoa, there's a whole new world out there that I didn't even know existed. Uh, it's really cool, it's really fun. Uh, but I will say, if you're serious about your triathlon goals, get on those clipless pedals as soon as possible. Get used to, we'll call a real bike, a road bike with clipless pedals and shifting because you need to get used to that. It's a skill and you have to practice it. And the sooner you start using clipless pedals and getting used to that, the better for your cycling. Yeah, absolutely. And then I'll probably add to that, just enter a triathlon. Absolutely. I mean, you've obviously come, you're coming from running, you've got some fitness there and providing you can swim and cycle to a degree, then you're probably going to get yourself around a triathlon. It may not be pretty, but it'd be fantastic just to get that experience and then that motivation going forwards and a lot of learnings from that. So Absolutely, muddle your way through the first one. You're gonna make a bunch of mistakes, forgive yourself for those, but you'll also learn a whole lot. You'll know exactly what you need to work on to improve the next time and you can take it from there. Yeah, it's exciting. I mean, anyone getting into triathlon is a very exciting time. So wish you all the best and do let us know how you get on in the comments section down below. Um, if you enjoyed today's video, please do give it a thumbs up, give it a like, and don't forget to give a subscribe down below and send in more questions using GTN Coaches Corner.